So, hello, hello. Super exciting. Thank you so much for coming. It's uh, good to be here. I recognise quite a few faces in the audience. That's always I, nice. I know it's it's fantastic. It kind of feels like uh, we're in a living room with friends. But <laughs> let's get straight into it. So. We have a lot of early stage founders in the audience um, and uh, people that may be starting to think about expanding. So usually you're, when you're starting to think about uh, expanding, you're usually a market leader on your own turf. But, but then when you kind of move around the world, then um, it gets a little bit more difficult. You're not really sure where to start. So what are the first things that you think about when you're starting to expand to other countries? Well, I have experience of two different, very distinct strategies. The first is going local and then going global. Yep. And the second is going global from the outset. And I would say as a startup, it's really important to go global from the outset if you can from an infrastructure perspective. And to give you some very tangible data on why that is, I remember a time when adding a column to a database with over 100 million rows took about three weeks. And the column was to show which entity and which country the data belonged to. That's because we went local first and then went global. So as a startup, if you can, build all of your infrastructure to be global from day one. Fantastic. So making it easy for yourself to, to go global so that you're not, you're not only thinking about once, oh, yeah, OK, I'm, I'm getting big now. Maybe I should think about moving away, but, but actually making it easy for yourself then. Exactly. And that doesn't just stop with technology. Mm -hmm. um, it also filters into accounting, finance, operations, taxation. If all of that infrastructure, internal design, organizational design is, is built with a multi-country mindset, it's probably uh, a similar lift to go from one country to two countries as it is to go from one country to multi-country um, when you're a mature business. So if you can build all that infrastructure to be multi-country from the outset, I, I highly recommend it. So once, once you're thinking about going to this multi-country or, or expanding in the first place, so how do you choose where to go? I mean, there's a lot of countries that you could possibly go to, but how do you choose the, the right country? And how do you also then define the, the product relevancy in any specific given market? Well, yeah, great question. I mean, we talked a lot about the, uh, the barriers on the technical side or on the regulatory side, but What's the point of going to a country if you don't deeply understand your customers and build a product that your customers really want? We see so many technology businesses that are successful on their home turf, and they go into another country, and they kind of try and force feed their product to the customers in that country. And I think that's really dangerous. And we saw that with a lot of European neobanks trying to go into the US. Uh, many of them have since withdrawn because they tried to force the product onto American and American people, and it just simply didn't work. So it's really important to deeply understand your customers, whether they're consumers or businesses, understand the sales cycle, and actually build a product that they, um, that they truly, truly want. Yeah, OK, fantastic. So. Some places, obviously, depending on, on where you're, you're kind of starting out from, it's a lot easier to expand into specific markets than, than it is in others. So what do you think? Do you take the easier way out and go just one country over? Or, or, or do you brave the difficulty and focus more on, on the potential of the markets? And, also related to this, has, has this kind of changed over time? Because when, when you're quite small, obviously, it might, be, it might be nicer to take the easy way out. But does this change then once you go bigger? Do you get more bold? Do you make those more difficult decisions then? I think uh, once you've understood the customers and understood the opportunity, you then have a list of, of countries that are relevant for, you, for your business and for your product. And you can then start to develop a strategy around which are the easy countries and which are the difficult countries. And some of the countries are technically easy, some of the countries are technically difficult. You have full control over those um, technical barriers and technical items most of the time, so um, that makes execution quite easy. Where it gets more difficult is political, 
issues. Some countries are politically easy, some countries are politically hard. So going to Europe, European Union, for example, is pretty politically easy. Um, it's easy to set up a business there. There's a free market. It's easy to get a business license and be regulated. It's also pretty easy to understand your customers and build a product that they really want. So many companies do um, spread out across the EU um, very quickly. Um, going into foreign countries where they're technically difficult but, and also more politically different is um, something which is much harder and we often see that happening much later in a company's life cycle. Uh, I'll use Uber as an example. Uber went very global from, um, from day one, similar to Deal, and um, they never really conquered China. They left uh, China to, to uh, much later in their journey and the political difficulties were outside of their control. And it meant that they really couldn't ever successfully expand into China. So, so do you think that China would have been a, a, good, a good place to go to in, in the end? Or, or do you think it's best to leave those really difficult markets to, to the people that kind of know their markets best? Or Yeah, I think... Um tackle the technical problems. You have control over the technical problems, but leave the political problems until, until later, until your team is more advanced and you have people looking after and watching public policy, watching regulation, watching communications, things like that. Yeah, yeah. So a little bit related to this, like often copy pasting your exact product doesn't, doesn't necessarily work when going to a new location or a new culture. So is, is this that's something that Deal or, or Revolut has, has actually taken into account when kind of selecting the places uh, that you expand to um, and, and also finding the, the product market fit? Yeah, it, it rarely works. Even in the European Union where you have a free market and you have the same currency in, most, uh, in most, most countries, same tax regime or similar tax regime, copy and pasting just doesn't, doesn't really work. And um, I think it's really important to identify the value for customers. And we've, we've seen European fintechs, particularly British fintechs, go to EU and they have had great success in markets like Poland. For example, Poland has its own currency, the Polish Lotti, but a lot of the residents also want to transact in the euro. So those European fintechs that had multi-currency capabilities were able to go into EU and actually specifically Poland and enter with a multi-currency strategy, and um, they were highly, su highly successful. Um, the deal, we were kind of global first, so selecting those countries where we can create value was um, much easier to actually execute on. So we were able to go to all corners of the globe and actually create value for customers relatively easily. Okay. So something a little bit more related to what, what, what Deal does now, could you talk a little bit more about the, the kind of hiring trends that you're seeing? and? Um, where are companies kind of looking to acquire talent and is this something that would be, would be relevant for, for kind of early stage founders and, and startups in the audience as well? Yeah, I think the general um, perception at the moment is that remote working is on the decline. Now, Deal is not supporting remote working exclusively. In fact, rather the contrary, we're diversifying away from remote working and um, broadening our product and focus to look at all things HR across the globe. However, remote working is certainly not declining. In fact, we're seeing an increase. And we're seeing an increase in companies hiring in APAC and Latin America. Particularly draw your attention to Latin America. Latin America, while most people think it's across the Atlantic, which of course it is, um, we have a couple of time zones and major cities on those time zones that are actually right in the middle of the Atlantic. I, um, would call out Argentina, Buenos Aires, and um, Rio Sao Paulo. Uh, from a time zone perspective, they're in the middle of the ocean, which means that um, European and American companies can benefit from that. And we're seeing a ton of activity in there. Those companies are hiring people in LATAM. And we've seen salaries in Latin America increase 40% year on year, which is um, really quite impressive. So. Let's say I'm a, I'm a European startup and I'm thinking like, oh, okay, well, maybe after this talk, then Latin America, oh, that might be a good place to expand to. Like, 
what would be the, the, the kind of steps? It just seems such, such a, a big step and a, a scary kind of area to, to go to. I, I feel much safer going to, to someone, or like, I don't know, if I'm a Finnish startup, but to Sweden, that like, do you think that Latin America is a, is a good place to, to kind of consider at the early stages, or is that some, something where more mature uh, startups and uh, scale-ups could, could, could think yeah, about? Yeah, I think to break the ice, companies should start to think about the um, skills of the, of the people rather than their uh, location. When you start to think about the skills rather than the location, you actually see the talent is everywhere. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, you can grow the size of your talent market um, by many, many multiples. For us, a deal we started out in San Francisco, we're now in over 100 different countries in terms of our own team. And if somebody asks me, hey, Dan, where do you think you will have the most engineers four years from now? I for sure would not say Brazil. And Brazil is where we have the most engineers working for a deal today. And why is that? Because there's such good talent in Brazil and they're located in such a good time zone, it's a great market for us to hire tech talent in. Okay, fantastic. So going a little bit more into the, the kind of people and the cultural stuff, um, managing people in countries abroad and, and it's, it's not easy. Like I, I've got teams across four different continents and well, I don't actually always know um, the best about how to tackle a, a specific market and I'm not going to pretend to know uh, exactly what, what should be tackled and where I should start. So um, with Slushed, we actually trust the, the local teams to run the operations in these new places. Um, so how, how would you go about making sure that, that the right team is, is helping you to expand with, with co uh, companies like Deal and, and with Revolut? I think decentralization is, is key. For us, we have entities in about 130 of the 180 or so countries that we support on the platform. Each country or group of countries has its own group of people on the ground. Mm. So we have um, a local CFO, we have a local operations leader, a local payroll leader, HR leader, and legal counsel. And collectively, this team is our on the ground team handling the operational side of the business. And then if we decide we really want to enter that country from a go-to-market perspective, we'll pair it with a sales team. And the sales team, we will have um, business development uh, analysts and representatives, SMB sales, um, mid-market sales and enterprise sales, and customer success. And then collectively, you have this really decentralized team that can um, uh, that has the autonomy to get things done. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to rely on approval or decisions from headquarters. They're able to take full advantage of their local market expertise and actually get stuff done very, um, very quickly. Okay. Something that's, that's sort of taught in, 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 in a business school or, or even when you're kind of looking on, online about um, expansion is, is the kind of the intercultural management um, within a team. Um, uh, you're, you're generally taught to respect every culture and, 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 and uh, be, be really kind of um, respectful to, to the people that you're interacting with. And that's, that's generally pretty easy, uh, that, that you can always manage, manage the kind of respect from your side. But sometimes that doesn't always go both ways and something that maybe uh, women and, and sort of minorities face a little bit more as well is that um, there's not the, the respect uh, happening both ways. So how, how do you kind of combine your own culture um, with the local culture in order to turn it into a kind of asset when expanding? Uh, I think embrace is the key word. And that starts with internal embrace. Well, let me give you an example. We run a company all hands every two weeks. We get all 3,000 people from over 100 countries together. And of course, we cover really important business topics but we also cover cultural spotlights. And as an example, recently I've seen a great cultural spotlight on the Indian festival of Diwali. I've seen a cultural spotlight on Ramadan. I've also seen country specific spotlights. Hmm. And our internal dealers are running these spotlights. So um, that's really, really cool to educate 
um, the company and the people's peers about cu culture and international culture. And of course, that then filters down into the product and eventually into the customer. So mm -hmm. a deal we're very, very multicultural. Yeah, yeah. So, so do you think education is, is kind of the way to, to combat that then? Um, making sure that people are know about how things work in, in different cultures and, and then navigating that then. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Fantastic. Um, so now going into more of the, the kind of hands-on tangible advice, uh, as, as we like to, to kind of joke about at Slush, um, can you tell me about one of the, the biggest challenges that you've actually faced um, while expanding Revolut um, that you then ended up taking to deal? Mm. Centralizations of decisions in international expansion, it can be quite um, uh, dangerous in the sense that they can slow things down. They mm -hmm. can actually halt progress um, immediately. The other thing is if the international expansion playbook is too tight, mm -hmm. it actually stops the local people from being excellent. So we have put together what I would call a pretty uh, loose playbook for expansion, which sets out the fundamental kind of guardrails. Um, and I kind of imagine this as kind of a kid's, a kid's play area. You know, we've given a big play area for the international team to go out and do things and learn about the market and execute and build things. But at the edges of the play area, there are very tight guardrails. Mm. And what's really important is those guardrails aren't, aren't too tight because that will slow things down. Combine that with decentralized decision making so the local CFO and the local team can actually make decisions and action things very quickly mm. with their own budget, their own PL, their own product roadmap. It means expansion can be done um, much quicker. At Deal, we wanted to get to those 130 countries with our own entities very, very quickly. This takes most companies decades. So we put together uh, country by country scoping documents to understand what had to happen in order to set up the entity, get a bank account, get a business license, hire the people. And for most countries, we realized that it would take about one year. And then we said, well, how can we do this in, in one month? <laughs> and actually, in some cases, how can we do it in one week? And that led to quite interesting stories of um, the leadership team flying between different countries with a physical HP printer in our luggage. So we would arrive in different countries, we would print off documents, we would meet with the um, notary or local apostille and actually file for the business license. And we would always file with, um, with an expedited argument. So we wanted to have our entity set up as quickly as possible. The other thing that I would say is that international expansion is generally very costly. And on average, to set up the bare minimum infrastructure is around half a million dollars. And if you want to actually develop products and um, build a local team, that can quickly go to five or even $50 million. We built this and executed on this with a much smaller budget. Mm. And um, we did most of that in-house. That's how we, that's how we um, did it on such a low budget. We didn't rely on external consultants, external law firms, as much as others would. And that's really advantageous for us at Deal because all of that local market knowledge that we um, obtained internally through our local teams now sits with us um, exclusively. Okay, so kind of going back a little bit, um, you said you said to have um, a kind of like a loose guideline, but how do you how do you define what's uh, loose enough, uh, or, or uh, what what happens when you kind of need to have these specific things when you have specific expectations that you absolutely have to meet? Like, how do you drive the kind of the biggest things that you need home whilst keeping it still? loose enough to have the, have the local teams have ownership of, of the things that, that they need to take ownership over? Yeah, the way, the way I think about it is, let's say we are building a um, technology conference like, like Slash. Mm. I think there are two ways, two ways to do it. The first way is you write a very strong specification and blueprint. And it's extremely tight. It details everything. It says the chairs are to be black, the ceiling is to be 15 meters in the air, and the air temperature is to be this, and dot, 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 dot. And then you employ the various people to actually make that happen. And they follow the um, specification step by step. 
the flip side of that is what you could do is you could give a very loose um, specification and say, I want to run this technology conference. I want to host however many thousand people. I want it to be in Helsinki. And you employ really smart, excellent people to make that happen. Mm. And they will actually make judgment calls way better than the original person writing the specification. They can find the best location in Helsinki. They actually find that the air temperature at 18 degrees is a little bit too cold, and it should be 20 degrees. And if you give the people the agency to do that and actually demonstrate their excellence and brilliance, you will have a far better product at the end of it. So yeah, kind of leaving, leaving the team to do what they do best and more stepping back as a, a more of an advisor, I guess, exactly. in, in, in a sense. Okay, fantastic. Um, so when, you, when you're tackling international expansion, um, there's kind of two ways that I guess you could go about it. You could either go full steam ahead, let's just go, let's spend the however many million euros or that, that you were kind of mentioning about earlier, or is kind of going with smaller, more incremental steps useful whilst you're starting out? Because one, once you have that money to spend, then sure, let's go. But if, you, if I don't have much money, if I'm kind of uh, expanding into international markets in order to get that, that kind of the revenue, then uh, are the smaller steps more useful? Yeah, yeah I think if th the infrastructure is built with international in mind, then it becomes really easy to experiment. And it is possible to experiment on a cross-border basis. Yeah. So for example, if you're a business here in Finland uh, and you've designed your infrastructure and your product and your database and your tax and accounting structure to work in different countries, it's probably not too hard to sell to a few customers in Sweden. And maybe, the, maybe there's no value proposition in Sweden. Maybe the customers are already served by another product in Sweden. So maybe you will go to Spain or Portugal. And I think if you go step by step and start to test the water really early on, that's a good way to uh, start expanding. Okay, so keep it so keeping things in house and going with the small steps. That's kind of how to how to start. Exactly. Start going on. Yeah. Okay. So wrapping up a little bit, then what would be if everyone forgets? everything about what we just said because to be honest you're probably not going to remember the half an hour talk or uh, or most of the other talks on stage but if there is one thing that you want people to remember about international expansion or about this topic in general what what would you want people to take away i think take very small incremental steps or baby steps towards the objective Setting up in a new country might seem like an impossible task, but if you start to break down that task into really small steps, you will eventually get there. And move very quickly. We have a principle, a, a deal referred to as deal speed, which means completing that incremental step as quickly as you can. And that might be as something as small as sending an email or making a call. And we say to people at Deal, make the call now, send the email now, do the thing now, and don't sit on it until after lunch or till the end of the day or till next week or till Monday morning. And if you can do that thing as quick as possible, as soon as possible, cumulatively, all of those incremental gains across the entire workforce, across the entire company, will sum to something which is significant. And that will provide momentum within the organization with the customers to keep you moving forward as quickly as you can. What would be something that you've learned over the past six months or so in, in regards to the topic of, of expansion that you wish you would have known sooner or, or you thought, oh my gosh, this makes so much sense, but I've not really thought of this before? Um, I think never assume. <laughs> yeah. um, I think countries might seem similar, especially when you get to different regions, you might see two countries the same, maybe they speak the same language, or maybe they speak the same currency, or rather use the same currency. Um, never assume things are equal. I think every country is different. They have their own cultures, laws, ways of working. You've n I've never seen uh, two countries that are the same uh, from that side of the um, table, but also from a customer side. The customers are, are not the same just because they speak the same language or use the same currency. Fantastic. 
Thank you so much. Uh, I think this has been uh, really insightful and interesting. Is there one piece of advice that you would still like to leave, leave on? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, if, if you want to hear uh, more from, from Dan, uh, we'll be in the Q&A session in the mentoring area, just to the side of the stage in just a moment. Um, so come and hear more and uh, ask your questions then. Awesome. Thanks so Thank much. Thanks so much. Yes.